Bonjour tout le monde. Malheureusement, cette conférence serait en anglais, car je ne parle pas français. <rire> euh, D'accord. Je, je peux parler un, un petit peu. <rire> In the beginning, there was a place, a place of life, of laughter, of love where the word said, thou shalt not worry about trivial things like non-believers and steam reviews. But there is another place, a dark place. You might be familiar with it, where people only go when they're unhappy. An endless stream of shouting and arguing, faceless avatars yelling at you for no reason. But it's also somehow the best place for networking in the games industry. Yes, I'm talking about Twitter. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Perhaps that's not very appropriate in this country, but. <laughs> but now children, if you're here in this house, of all the places in the world you could be, you're listening to this sermon, you're a part of this congregation, then I have just one question for you. Ooh, did not mean to do that. I have one question for you. These people are trying to start a cult, so security, can we round them all up? <laughs> I'm going to need their names associated in individuals, but don't worry. Here we accept people of all belief systems. And if you're here, that I know that you want to help grow our cult today. So who is ready? Who's ready to grow our cult? So step one, how are we going to grow this cult? We need to tell people about it. Let's try to think of a few different ways to tell people about our cult. Hmm, maybe if we could get involved with a really big event. Does anyone have Jeff Keighley's phone number? Get in the Game Awards or <laughs> Summer Games Fest? There's a lot of people, I think, our cult, we have some good values. I think we could help them. Maybe if we do some Google ads or like web ads, if we got pool all of our money together, we could do something there. Or what if we sponsored someone really famous or an influencer? You know, a lot of celebrities have a long history with cults. And there's definitely some press outlets with cult followings. I'm not going to name any names. Or we could go to live events because, you know, people pay hundreds of euros to attend things like this. <laughs> They'll probably listen to us so that they get their money's worth. Some of you, you work for big companies. And maybe you could get, uh, get, get us in contact with them to support our cult growth, or how about we talk about something that's free, that can grow exponentially, and certainly has absolutely no downsides. I'm talking about social media. And that is what I work in. My name is Jared J. Tan. I'm the community strategist at Devolver Digital, and I'm also a chartered professional CPA accountant. I've only been working in games for about two and a half years, so if you don't feel like an accountant is qualified to talk about games, that's not very nice. <laughs> but before joining Devolver, I was the community manager for Cult of the Lambs launch last year. I got to work with Massive Monster. They're a small dev team that at the time of launch, they had five full-time employees. And since the game launched, things have been pretty good for all of us. If you haven't heard of Cult of the Lamb, congratulations. That means you're in a healthy mental state and are not on gaming Twitter. But it's a game where you start your own cults of cute forest animals. As the last lamb in the world, a god asks you to grow a cult. You'll slay heretics and sometimes convince them to join your cult, where you'll need to feed them, give them sermons, and most importantly, clean up their poop. In gameplay, it's a crossover between a roguelike dungeon crawler and a farm management sim. Kind of like a messed up Animal Crossing, but more realistic because you can't buy a house. <laughs> that one works everywhere now. <laughs> the game was published by Devolver Digital and launched on PC, Switch, PlayStation, and Xbox uh, last August. And I started working with the Cult of the Lamb team about one month before launch. So how big is our cult? Well, we might just be the biggest cult in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and
And here are some stats from my first three months uh, from when I started working on Cult of the Lamb. Twitter followers passed 150,000, TikTok over 200,000, and Discord over 60,000. And that pink blob is the game's revenue in that time. And these social numbers, they sound very big, because really they are very big for a game made by such a small team, uh, but they're really a very tiny part of the game's overall success. In 10 days after launch, we sold 1 million copies, and by the end of 22, reached gold status on Steam for new releases alongside the PC versions of games like Persona 5, God of War, Spider-Man, Final Fantasy VII Remake, but that didn't come from nowhere. Uh, Massive Monster has been making games for over a decade, starting with Flash games, then moving to PC and consoles, and really struggling hard to eventually reach this point for, to have this big, really big success. But before I continue, I also need to give credit to someone who has really kept Cult of the Lamb relevant on social media and in the general gaming culture. This is Josie Fletcher. She runs the social media accounts uh, starting from the beginning of this year, and she's been doing an amazing job. If you've seen any of the crazy stuff that goes on on the Cult of the Lamb social media, especially on the Twitter, that's thanks to her. And with her at the helm, we've gained over 200,000 new followers across Twitter and TikTok. And also, I need to give a huge amount of credit to our community of fans. Their art, their videos, animations, streams, tattoos, they're what drive the Cult of the Lamb's popularity. These are some pretty crazy numbers, especially for a game made by a team this small. There's millions of views on YouTube and TikTok videos, over 100,000 likes on things like fan art, like the one on the left there, and it was the sixth most watched game on Twitch at launch time, and with over 130,000 concurrent viewers pushing it ahead of League of Legends momentarily. That was crazy. And if you are a fan, and if, if you are here today, and you are a fan of Cult of the Lamb, from all of us at Devolver Digital and at Massive Monster, thank you. So before we get into the weeds of this presentation, I'm gonna give you the big takeaway right at the start. If you'll remember one thing, this is it. Games go viral. And what I mean by that is the biggest factor to sell your game is your game. And we're not talking about whether your game is good because, well, good is subjective and really there's so many good games out there. Think about it like this you're competing with every other thing someone could do in their life. Have you tried touching grass? It's better than most games. <laughs> and I completely agree. You wanna think about and ask yourself, is your game truly outstanding? I mean, literally, does your game stand out? How does it compare to every other thing someone could be doing in their lives? Not just other games, but all the other kinds of media or just, you know, participating in society, which takes so much mental energy. How can you convince them that your game is worth their time in that context? The biggest factor behind Cult of the Lamb's success is the work of these guys. These are the three founders and directors of, of Massive Monster, and they weren't thinking about how can our game go viral. They were thinking about how can our game be fun and memorable? And then along the way, they made something that truly did all of those things. I think the key word there is memorable. There's an old marketing rule of thumb called the seven touch points, where it takes, a, it takes an average of seven touch points for a potential buyer to make a purchasing decision. But what is a touch point? Here are some examples. It's basically any time someone encounters your thing, whether that's your cult or your game or your brand or your product, in any kind of context. So, sorry, here are the examples. Things like a physical connection where you meet someone at a networking event. Just yesterday I met someone for the first time and they said, oh, I haven't played Cult of the Lamb, but I've seen it on social media and now it's meeting you, like now maybe you have a, another touch point to potentially buy it. Or seeing an ad or your logo. Um, obviously some of these are kind of old, like a phone call, no one does those anymore. Type. In the new era, what are the possible ways can you get your thing in front of people's eyes? All of these channels are a new potential touch point. Each time they see your thing, whether it's through a streamer or an article or on social media, they're one step closer to potentially buying it. And there are so many different channels to pursue, as you can see here, and whether you're, uh, 
whether you're a small indie or from a big publisher, we're all trying to find which is the best way to spend our time and budget. So what are the benefits of using social media as one of those primary channels for your game? Number one, it is low cost compared to some of the other channels uh, because anyone can post something for free. Number two, it has exponential potential because it's built on people interacting and resharing things that they see and that they like. And number three, it's built on connections to people you already follow, which make it kind of like a pseudo word of mouth. If I see some, a friend of mine retweeting something, then that's a sign that they endorse it. But I know what you're thinking. Does social media convert? Does it actually lead to tangible wish lists or sales? And if, if I somehow win the lottery and get a viral post, will that lead to things that will actually like, end up in my wallet? The answer is sometimes. The secret to big sales is making an outstanding game. Um, and that doesn't always have to be something very unique. It doesn't have to be the, the best art style or the most innovative new game. For example, Vampire Survivors is outstandingly fun to play. It keeps people in Steam and spending money, so Steam continues to push it to more people. Sales platforms make money when things are sold there, so their algorithms will promote games that have the highest chance of actually generating revenue. And if that's you, if that's your game, then you'll get a sale and they get their cut. So they want to promote things that will actually sell. And it's, a, it's definitely a case of the rich getting richer. But if you're a small developer making your own games, um, you might not have some of these advantages. Outstanding doesn't have to be entirely new. Uh, many games, they release a new version every single year. You know, you can think what I'm talking about. And the, those new versions might not even be very different. They might not even be the best game in their genre, but they provide an outstanding value proposition of a community of players, that their friends play the specific game, that there's familiarity with the brand recognition. And yeah, as a small dev, you probably don't have all of those advantages. Um, but during this talk, I'll tell you the story of how Massive Monster designed a game that stood out without having these to start with. And back to the question, does social media actually convert to tangible results? I know it can often feel like this. <laughs> and uh, there are certainly studios that have pretty big social media followings, and those don't always translate to sales. Even at Devolver, we have over 300,000 Twitter followers and over 200,000 YouTube subscribers, but I can tell you that our games definitely do not always sell like that number of, of units. But there are examples of games getting significant boosts from social media. This is X01. It's a really neat solo dev game where you play as a disc flying through crazy planets in space. And with the help of future friends, they had pretty big TikToks that led to wish list conversions that were comparable to bringing the game to Gamescom. So like just a TikTok that you might make in half an hour versus going to Gamescom and those leading to the same number of wish lists, that's clearly an example that it can convert to something. Or if you're on social media, on Twitter or TikTok, you've almost certainly seen this game, Tiny Glade. This is a graph of Tiny Glade's newsletter subscribers with huge spikes correlating to when they have a viral TikTok video or a viral tweet. In just a few months of having their Steam page live, they've earned over 250,000 wish lists and have entered the top 100 upcoming wish listed games and a lot of that was driven from social media. This is Hypercharge. It's a two-year-old game that got a bunch of new life from a really good Twitter campaign. And there's other ones too, like Choo Choo Charles or Trombone Champ, all games that did well on social media, which led to real tangible results. And like I said before, social media is just one of the possible channels. At Devolver, we have the advantage of that we're trying to leverage all of the channels as best as we can. Cult of the Lamb had a, an amazing reception from influencers and streamers through the work of Clara Sia, our senior influencer strategist. Um, it had an amazing Twitch integration made by Streaming Toolsmith. Uh, it was in Summer Games Fest. It was at PAX East. It was in Steam Next Fest. It leveraged as many of these as we can. And social media is just one small part of it. It's just my little corner of that big equation that led to the game doing really well. So, attention. 
That is marketing currency. When someone is scrolling down their timeline, or when, just think about it, when you're scrolling down whatever social media platform you use, what actually gets you to stop and look more closely at whatever you've scrolled? You have to think, of, once again, you have to think about when someone could be doing anything else in their life, what are you gonna do to convince them to at least give you a tiny bit of their attention? So I'm gonna share three things that I think about when I'm making any form of content for social media, but generally uh, about the games. And these are my three steps of what I call content design. Number one, grabbing attention for discovery. Number two, converting attention into interest. And number three, rewarding attention with an emotional response. And then, I'm also gonna explain how this, all of this started with Massive Monsters Design and then how that translate, translates to different platforms like Twitter, TikTok, and on Steam. Okay, let's do it. Number one, grab attention for discovery. This is a game about starting your own cult. And I think that already grabs attention. When scrolling down your timeline, think about what actually makes you stop and look. And then what, what are you thinking about before you click and before you watch? How can you try to get them to at least give you a little bit of time. Uh, some ways to do that are eye-catching visuals or surprising messages like this. Cult of the Lamb does not support National Boyfriend Day, which I'll get into more in a bit. But I try to get into a noob mindset. What does it look like to someone who doesn't know anything about your game? Remember, that's the point that we're trying to start with. They don't know who you are at all, and they have no reason to, to, give, you, to give you any attention. So you have to fight for that. So, Massive Monsters' previous two games were both 2D platformers where you play as a little guy. They weren't bad games, but you know, 2D platform play as a little guy, that sounds like, I don't know, 60% of all games out there. So they didn't do particularly well. And after that, they came up with a new gameplay idea to merge two popular genres, roguelike and base building. And then with that in mind, they tried to build a player fantasy around that gameplay loop. The fantasy had to be appealing, a unique, appealing, and easy to explain. Perhaps it could be so easy that it could fit in just four words. So they thought of things like start your own hell, start a witch's coven, start your own cult. So this is from the very early stages of ideating um, what the game could possibly be, and they were already thinking about how can we condense this, how can we make this into as short as just a four-word pitch to be appealing to someone who has no idea what it was before. Okay, now we get to watch some TikToks. So if this is the first time for you, oh, oh sound, uh, sound. Hmm. Not sure why the sound isn't working. Um, so this was working before. Hmm. Oh man, these are great. I trust. I promise. I, I promise you, they are funny. <laughs> um, hmm. This is the right thing, right? Is there any help? Oh man. Okay. Well, I guess I'll just I'll voice over these again. Have you ever considered joining a cult? <laughs> it's a great place to make friends, have fun, and eat some tasty food. Mm -hmm. There's a few folks who don't really agree with how we do things around here, but that's why we show them love to change their minds, or else. Cult of the Lamb is available on Switch, PlayStation, Xbox, and PC. <laughs> <laughs> So when we're thinking about discovery, the first question is who might see this thing on your platform? And it's gonna be a different kind of person on every single platform. In this case, on TikTok, it's people who trend younger. And it might sound kind of stupid, but it's also people who already use TikTok. But that means that they have a certain contextual, ex a certain context of expectations for what they come across in the app. Next, how will they actually see the content? TikTok videos automatically show up in what's called the For You page, and there isn't really a place to browse for new videos. 
And then finally, what will they actually see when it shows up? The video just starts playing, and now your job is to keep them from swiping away. So here are some stats from one of our pretty good performing videos with 700,000 views, and that retention graph at the left and the bottom left, that shows that more than 25% of viewers swipe away within two seconds. So that's the kind of attention that you're fighting for on a platform like TikTok. You have literally two seconds to convince someone to continue watching your video. So that's where, the, going back to the start, the start of the design of this four-word pitch, something that can be very fast, it becomes effective on all sorts of platforms. Then on Steam, we're thinking about who is on, the, on Steam. It's people who already play games, they play on PC, they're looking for more games to play um, that, because a large portion of people on Steam only ever play the same games, like whether that's CSGO or um, whatever other game that they are always in. And then how can they see your content? It can come up on algorithmic recommendations, so that could be at the bottom that says games you might like, or on the front page if you're lucky enough to be there, or when you first launch your game. And then what will they actually see? They see the capsule art, the first screenshots, the tags, the review numbers, so yeah, this is an example of when Lil Gator Game first launched, it got, it got to be on the front page on, on new and trending, and you can see that's literally what we're working with. Um, and before I even hover, all you'd see is the capsule art and the title and the tags and the price. And then when I hover now, we can see the screenshots. So once again, there's so little attention that you're fighting for, and that's what you're trying to use to convince someone to even scroll over and then possibly click on your page. Next, we have converting at attention into interest. So you've grabbed their attention. How do you keep them looking? And then what are you gonna try to do with that attention? The Massive Monster team, they thought of an idea called trailer moments. These are moments that look very impressive, moments that people will remember, things that show something interesting about the game. So I think that's pretty clear. We're looking for big, flashy visuals um, that just last a few, and even if they just last a few seconds, they can make a big impact and be something that people remember. But if your trailer moments are also things that are unique and show how your game stands out, it can be even more effective. Here we have the sacrifice ritual. And most of the rituals in the game are optional, but the game forces you to do this ritual at least once. And it doesn't just look very impressive. Obviously, you can see lots of flashy visuals going on at the same time here, but it also shows the vibe and the premise of the game. It's not just a normal cult sacrifice with a dagger and an altar. There's, you know, a Cthulian tentacle monster coming out of the ground. Also, the, the animal that's being sacrificed, they start really scared, they're right in the middle, but then you can see their emotions change to like happy acceptance at the end, which shows the twisted nature of the game. And the other animal cultists around it wearing the little hoods, they're almost doing like a little chibi dance. Uh, so once again, showing the, the twisted and, and the, the, the premise and the vibe that you get from this game. It doesn't just catch the attention because it's flashy, but it also teaches something more about why this game is unique in the context of all possible games someone could buy or play. And another, one, another thing they talked about is supporting the fantasy. So they brainstormed different kinds of mechanics and they wanted to support this fantasy that they started with, once again going back to that four word pitch of starting your own cults of cute animals. And any mechanics that didn't support this fantasy got cut. James, the art director, he was watching John Wick one day and he realized that everything in the John Wick universe is about assassins. It's, uh, John Wick is obviously a, an assassin, but then he fights against other societies of assassins, his family is assassins. Um, the whole world is built around this world of assassins and that's what they tried to do with Cult of the Lamb. They built a world of cults where the bosses, the enemy bosses are bishops, the enemies themselves are cultists wearing like cultist robes. There's religious Im imagery with crosses and pentagrams everywhere. And I think this trailer moment really shows that fantasy. This is a bit of a cutscene that happens before uh, the boss fight, and it starts off with this enemy bidget, bishop, who is a, who's a squid, but they're also a bishop, and which you'd expect to be kind of reserved, uh, and then obviously it transforms into this monstrous creature with lots of arms and lots of weapons. And then on Twitter, uh, you 
once again, you've grabbed, you've tried to grab their attention with something to stop them from scrolling. In this case, it's Cult of the Lamb does not support National Boyfriend Day. But then can, can you convert that information to something about your game, to teach the audience something that will last a bit longer than just some uh, prov provocative message? Why have one boyfriend when you can have several spouses? Uh, that tells the audience a new mechanic that you can't have, that, that you don't have in most games, where you can, like, I don't know, having sp several spouses is not a very common thing in most games, but once again, it fits the cult idea. It's a mechanic that actually is a part of the game. And then on TikTok, and on certain platforms, we might have a different kind of goal of how we're converting interest. On TikTok, we're thinking about how can this video be seen by more people? And, and this way, we need to understand how does this platform actually work? Videos will show up on your For You page, and then you can either do a positive engagement or a negative engagement. And the For You page will populate with videos that match your positive engagements. So for example, if I make a new account, and anytime I see videos that have dogs, I like and I comment, then and anytime I don't see a video with dogs, uh, I swipe away very quickly. Those are doing positive engagements on dogs, negative engagements on everything else, and over time, the algorithm will just keep on giving me videos of dogs or things they think that dog lovers will like. So um, we have this video. Let's see. I don't think the sound will work, but we, we're doing it again. <laughs> What animals should we put in our game? There's so many different ones to add to your cult. Cats, pigs, frogs, buffalo, Cthulhu. But now we need your help. Should we add a badger or a lion? Drop a comment if you're a badger baddie or if you're a simpin' for Simba. So in this case... <laughs> So in this case, um, with this very obvious engagement, we're trying to get someone to, like, we're making them, giving them only two options and then trying to involve them in our development process, which people on TikTok actually really like to do. This video ended up with over two million views on TikTok, and then every other video I posted for like several weeks or even more than a month later uh, would have many people answering other kinds of animals that they wanted to add to the game. And to be even more efficient, um, I would often pick animals that were already in the game, but maybe they didn't know. Things like they asked for an axolotl or a capybara, and then I would uh, take that comment and I would say, here is an axolotl in the game. And like that was something that the developers had already made, but now they feel that any animal they suggest could be added. Um, yeah, very efficient. But uh, last year, I tried to do a study to try and w to, f to find which of the positive engagements were the most effective for getting more views on TikTok. I got data from 1,500 videos from game studios who are promoting their games on TikTok organically, which means without any ad spend. And these videos had a sum of over 70 million views and ranged from accounts with just a few thousand followers to over a million followers. And what did I find? I found that likes and favorites have the strongest correlation with views, uh, but I did wonder, is that correlation or is it causation? So I also looked at another metric, watch time. Videos with more views have higher watch time and higher full watch percentage on average. In my sample, almost all videos with over 100,000 views had at least 10 seconds of average watch time. So, uh, my conclusion from that was I always try to make my videos at least 10 seconds long, so if someone watches the whole way through, then they're positively helping in the algorithm. And this makes sense because TikTok as a social media platform, their goal is to try to get people watching as long as possible. So if, if people can make content that will, keep, that will keep eyes on the app, keep eyes watching, and not looking at other, on YouTube or Twitch or wherever else, then that's good for them, so they want to promote these kinds of things, and their algorithm does that. And on Steam, this is the place where someone can actually do the final conversion of wishlisting or buying your game. Um, and what are the possible ways that they, what, what are the things that they see to, and what are the things that you have to convince someone to actually make that purchase? You have the Steam broadcast at the top of the page if one is live. Uh, then there's trailer, key art, description, screenshots, the body, details and GIFs. So when I, just, just think about what you do when you look at a new Steam page. When I look at a new Steam page, I will just scroll down and I'll try to get the gist, 
the, what unique elements, what is the art style, what kind of game it is, and those are the things that are informing my purchasing decision. But that is going to be different from someone else. Like I have a friend who loves, who only plays co-op games, so he'll look for the co-op tag, and if the co-op tag isn't there, then he won't even consider buying it because that's the only kind of game he plays. Um, so all of these things that are crucial to people actually making their buying decision and should be there and easy to access and easily viewable. If I scroll down a page and I don't see anything that shows me why I should actually buy this game, what makes this game unique, then I'm probably not going to buy it. And lastly, we have reward attention with an emotional response. So they've actually looked at your thing. Now what should they remember? And also, how should they feel? What do people expect with cults? Once again, we talk about this idea. Start your own cult of cute animals. This fit with Julian and James' art style, but they also chose a lamb as the main character to subvert the connotations around lambs and religious imagery, that they're a pure, innocent creature, and obviously making the lamb uh, the, the leader of the cult, the one performing all these twisted actions. Uh, it, it subverts those expectations, and it has a little bit of humor in itself because humor arises in surprise. And surprise is when unexpected things come together. That's literally what a meme is. It's when you connect unexpected context together. And it's way easier if people already have context. Like we know that Yoshi isn't supposed to look like that, so big Yoshi is already kind of funny just by looking at it. But if people don't know, which is basically almost everything that's not you know, Mario or Pikachu, you can try to link it to a context that people will know. It could be concepts, trends, personal stories, and even for games that you think that everyone would, everyone would know, ones that have sold millions and millions of copies or are supported by the biggest game companies, there's always more people who don't know it. Just the other day, I was talking to a developer who has worked in the industry for years. He said he tried this cool narrative text-heavy RPG with point-and-click mechanics, but he couldn't remember what it was called. And I'm thinking, okay, it's got to be something kind of obscure, maybe Citizen Sleeper or Norco or Pensamen or the, in, in Other Waters. But you want to know what game he was thinking of? Disco Elysium. <laughs> and he, didn't know what that was, even though he was someone who had you know, been in games and loved games for a long time. And that's why it's always worth to link it to something, to something that has a familiar context. So how do we do this? These are, are some examples from Twitter. Uh, once again, does this make us the biggest cults in the world, comparing ourselves to Scientology when we got 100,000 Twitter followers? Or this one, the legendary post. <laughs> this is by Josie. And that's actually fan art, once again, repurposing content when we had Twitter beef with uh, Angry Birds. So this is a, when I was working on Card Shark uh, with Nariel. It's a game about card cheating, and it and it's, doesn't really fit any particular genre. So instead, I connected it to the just general concept of cheating and teaching people how to cheat with game footage in the background. So. Three ways to cheat without sleight of hand. One, um, peak at dealing. Two, using something shiny. And three, distracting your opponents with a drink. You can try all these and more in our game, Card Shark. Yeah. <laughs> also a very French game, so. <laughs> oh man, okay, this one, this might be harder. I haven't rap done this rap in a while. Cool. Okay, I'll give it a shot though, just for you. Oh, there's no beat. Poop. You gotta clean it up or your followers get sick and could vomit. Poop. Collect it and fertilize crops so that they can grow more food. Then make it meal so your animals don't starve and so they don't die. But if they do, you can turn them into meat. Now you got more food. <laughs> there we go. You can also link it to something that's trending, like the, this is when the Mario movie first trailer dropped. On the left, it was a poster. Uh, you can see this lamb movie poster. It said, retweet if you want a lamb movie. And obviously, we got to add Chris Pratt to it because we're connecting to the Mario movie. This, we posted that the day the Mario movie trailer first released, the first trailer. 
And then the next day, I made what was a fake lamb movie trailer, which used audio from Chris Pratt in, the, in that trailer. Um, both of these are actually repurposed assets. The poster on the left is from the, illustra the illustration from the vinyl cover of the game, and the one on the right is uh, the animation is from uh, the first animated trailer for the game that released uh, about a year before I used it in this case. So once again, just using things that you've already, you already have made or that already exist because there's always more people who don't know that that's where it's from. And many people thought like, wow, they made this whole animation just for this joke. No, I just clipped this thing that we had for years already. <laughs> This is an example of how an, one asset can be used in many, many different ways. So at the top, we start with like a cutscene, and then it can be used as screenshots, which can be memes or reactions or in your patch notes uh, or in thumbnails, and, or it could be as short clips that can be as GIFs for other kinds of memes, uh, posted on different places where GIFs are used or as Discord stickers. Uh, it could be a video clip that you can then add with other video clips for, for other kinds of content like TikTok or different kinds of trailers. Uh, it could be the full version, which can go on your own channels or in partner channels, like on the PlayStation or the Nintendo channel, or in event showcases, because you need to submit these things to uh, events. Or um, you can even make them as a compilation, like all of the animated parts of the trailers, I put them together in one video, uh, that one on the Devolver channel, and that has a million and a half views. And that's all just repurposed uh, animations that were in previous trailers, but you put them together, call, put them, uh, make them, give it a new name, and then it has, you know, over a million views. So content efficiency, using the same asset in as many ways as you can. And even the suit is repurposed. Uh, we made it for me to attend the Game Awards when we were nominated, and um, we also tweeted to hop on the trend that we're saying that game developers have no fashion sense. I beg to differ. <laughs> And then I also wore it while presenting this talk at GDC, or obviously here, and at, PAX, at, a, at a PAX panel, and basically everywhere I go, now I'm representing the brand. And did you know that you can even anticipate trends? Because think about it, you're your own target market. If you're making a game, and you, you're probably excited about what you're making, at least I hope you are, so your fans will be excited about what you're excited about. You'll know you'll know what is gonna be big in that corner of social media. So going back to that, uh, the Chris Pratt and a Mario movie trailer, Nintendo actually announced that that trailer was gonna drop a few days in advance. So I put that time or the, that day in the calendar. I knew that, okay, we need to have something related to the word movie, uh, somehow involve Chris Pratt uh, in advance. So I, ha I was already brainstorming before the trend actually happened. So, all of the things like announcements, presentations, news, uh, new releases, these are all things that you can fill up in your calendar and you can try to participate to connect your thing to the context that other people are talking about and that other people know. And personal stories is another great way to connect, it, to, to connect your game to a context that people can relate to. Um, a, a lot of the time, the most important thing is framing. So if you remember uh, last year, there was a time when the when GTA 6 had a leak a uh, huge leak, and there were developers that were quoting a guy who said graphics are the first thing finished in a video game. So we hopped on that trend, and this asset here, it shows uh, different stages of, of really early prototyping that the game looked completely different, and on the right, it shows uh, what the game looked like at launch. Um, if you can sell your story along with selling the game, then that's a good way to gain visibility. It kind of shows the process, this personal story of why it's not just this product that you're making, but now you're selling the idea that it is very important to you. And people can connect to that personal story. It's a way you can link prior context to delight and surprise and make people feel new kinds of things. So I was talked a lot about humor through surprise, but in this case, you could add ideas of like personal stories. That's why on Reddit, you see many posts that are like, I quit my job to work in, to make this game or, or things like that. It's personal stories that people want to relate to. Oh, oh nice, this one actually worked. Nice video here. Look at that, look how far the game came. Okay, we're at the recap already, wow. So, 
Games go viral, and what I mean by that is the biggest factor to sell your game is your game. It's not that you're making a game that is trying to go viral, but if you're making a game that has outstanding elements, then it can catch in all sorts of marketing areas, whether that's through um, on social media or all sorts of other channels like these ones, which will eventually lead to seven touch points. You're trying to get your things seen in as many places as possible and whichever ones that you have access to, whether it's the presentations or ads or sponsorships or influencers or press conventions, platform stores or social media, all of those are ways that each time someone sees your thing, then they're one step closer to actually buying it. Can social media convert? It doesn't always convert, but it can sometimes, uh, like this example from Tiny Glade, who have done an amazing job, much better than I've done, to be honest. Uh, they're so good at social media. And then, content design. So how am I gonna think about these things that I'm posting? I'm not just putting things out in the world and hoping that they do well. I'm actually gonna think about how can I make this effective for the specific platform and then I will put that in, out into the world and try lots of things, but they should always have at least some form of thought that goes into it. Starting with grabbing attention for discovery. How do you grab someone's attention out of all the other things that they could be doing? Converting that attention into interest. Uh, converting that attention by teaching them something, not just showing a meme that's provocative or funny, but then also converting that into teaching something about the game. And lastly, rewarding attention with an emotional response. If you can also teach and also be funny and make them feel something that they actually want to share with more people, then that's even better. And now that touch point is so much stronger. So. Once again, my name is Jared J. Tan. Uh, I write about different kinds of marketing and social media and community ideas on my website, jaredtanj.com. Um, this is another idea, some ideas of uh, content design that I've written there. And you can follow me at ehjaredj on Twitter. And um, yeah, I guess that's the main place, and Instagram. But most importantly, the lamb stands out. Start your own cult of cute animals. It mixes two genres in a new way. It visually doesn't look like almost anything else on the market. So these are all ways that Cult of the Lamb as a game stands out from its peers. And the more ways that a game can stand out, then the better chance it has to do well. Sales numbers, they don't always correlate with social media numbers. And really, my work is just a small part of the more important, the more important thing that Cult of the Lamb is a good and a memorable, memorable and an outstanding game. So since I left my accounting career to work in games, what I enjoy most about what I do now is I get to spend time around people like all of you. I think we all know that games is certainly not the easiest field to work in. But whatever your specific job that you do in games, you are here because you want to be a part of this creative process. You want to be a part of making games. To bring that little bit of joy to someone's life when they play a game and they feel something. So I know that all of you are creators at heart. And you want to make something original. That's the core of creation, isn't it? Making something that's that's original, that's new, that's your own. And if you make something that stands out, that's all of those things, I think that game has a fighting chance. Thank you. <laughs>